Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, a Paramount podcast. I am Mike Casaza. It's Monday morning. Chris Anderson, that means two things. It's time for the weekly mailbag, subscriber questions, staff answers, and most importantly, it is no longer Thursday night or the early hours of a Friday morning. Check the calendar. It did happen. Houston does win in a Hail Mary Thursday night. West Virginia does squander a monumental opportunity to make a move in the conference and really answer a lot of questions about the team. Instead, the door is open. New questions come in, and that is probably why we are here today. I don't know if it's ever two steps forward, one step back, but it's felt like uh, if it was two forward, one back, it is a pretty big step back when it comes to reputation, perception, maybe present and future as well. Don't know what's your hunch based on the past couple of days that are supposed to cool the temperature a little bit, but temperature is a pretty <laughs> a pretty hot word right now. It's um interesting discussion because before this game I kept I kept getting asked about this. Went on a couple of the, you know, our, our usual you and I you know, rotate around. I don't know what their schedule is, but the like Sam guys and talk with them, talk to the Houston guys. And I kept saying that there's just this feeling like the other shoe is going to drop. I didn't want to infringe upon your waiting for the fall um, hmm. title. But there, I, I mean, I don't know if I was alone in that. But I'm sure there were WV fans who felt that way. But it did feel like it. there's just this, hey, when when is it going to happen where the defense falls apart? When is it going to happen where WV does something dumb and loses late? Because so far they've had these tight games and haven't done it. And then they just then they, then it happened Thursday. And now it's, you know, now again, you're waiting for the fall of, is this just a one-step thing? Is this a going to be multiple things? And it made me, in in your comment just a second ago, one step forward, two steps back, took me back to my comments last year, or yeah, I think it was before last year, of this isn't like walking up a staircase. This is almost like literally, you know, to take his trust the climb, climbing the mountain, where if you slip and fall, you don't just slip and slide back like a few feet. You are sliding down the hill, maybe all the way back to the beginning of where you started. And that's what one misstep can do for a game, for a season, for a coaching career at a, at a program. And I don't want to know if I want to go that far with Thursday night, but it has the potential to be one of those games, one of those losses that, you know, we're looking back upon here in like five weeks and being like, well, that was the end of it, huh? Right there. Yep. And again, I think that they really thought they were moving. And I I, I do sometimes butcher the English language here and idioms and all that stuff. But I think they were thinking that they were certainly capable of taking two steps forward, but they were not so beyond their reality that they were not going to evidently <laughs> take big steps back that it was not going to be a continuously forward-moving program. It was still climbing, progressing, evolving, whatever you want to say, and you're going to have steps back. That was a big step back. They progressed significantly in some areas that they had to this season, and that's why the defense is better. That's why the record was better. That's why they had done things that they had not yet done under Neil Brown. So, yeah, steps forward, but not so good that they're going to avoid every step back, and that one came due with interest, it felt like. And to your point, yeah. I had similar conversations as well. I guess they're trying to split the house here and having us both on the radio, Chris, because when I was on there Thursday, it was, is this the third best team in the Big 12? And I've never said yes <laughs> to that question the past couple of years. And then, like, I just, I wasn't, I didn't have my mind there, but I was thinking, wait a minute, tied for second, it has a chance to play Oklahoma and and win the game. I mean, that's when you play the, the game, you have a chance to win it. Whatever happens, obviously, is, is going to answer that question, but it never felt definitive. It just didn't because of so many things you just said. And then just I've had the opportunity in the past couple of days to talk to people that, that I know and I talk to, but just getting back to them last night on some things because, you know, their teams have games on Saturdays. And the, just the, the the questions they had are less curious and inquisitive now. And they're becoming more of statements as, you know, can this team keep this up to – didn't think this team was going to be able to keep this up. And this is like scouting stuff too, where you you find teams on film and overlap sometimes, or you're just you're getting ready for them or anything like that. We're just a fan of the game or concepts or people or you know the coach, whatever. But like those curiosities are starting to fade a little bit. 
and, and now you, you stare at the schedule and like again the schedule just is what it is and it should be easier on the back end now that's maybe not what we thought before but can they actually do that we'll see and the best thing that can happen to them is playing games and winning games right now but they're getting a, a pretty good coach who's got his team going back in the right direction again but when you sit down you look at it, they're both four and two and they both kind of hit potholes during the season just the west virginia's pothole happened to appear quite unexpectedly on thursday night but we've been over that we spent a lot of time on the thursday night post game podcast talking about the hail mary and dissecting that and what cat what did happen what could have happened what shouldn't have happened did not get into a lot of the the more important details in that game which would include that they did play pretty well at times they also played pretty bizarrely at times when it comes to offense Defense didn't look right. A lot of questions are left unanswered, which is why we are here today. Chris, dig into that mailbag, scoop out some questions. We'll get to the ones we can hear today. If you don't hear your question asked word for word, it's possible it was snowballed up into another one. And it's also possible that Chris will get to that when he does a written one later in the week. What do you say we get started here? Let's do it. We're going to kind of put a few of them together here. We're going to talk about running back room in general. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask the questions and we'll basically be moving down the depth chart. Cause I think we got questions about each and every running back in that room right now. Um, the first one's related to CJ Donaldson asking this one from timber pimp asking, does CJ t- look a step slower? Do you think he's running timid? Uh, like he's trying not to get injured. He doesn't do this offense any good. If he isn't going to run the ball hard, there was another question in here. I'll look for it in a second, but basically saying, you know, he's not moving forward. And even he started running better when West Virginia went with tempo better. Mike, what your thoughts on the play of Donaldson and how he's being used at the moment? Yeah, it's just not as good as it was last year. I don't, again, you have to ask him, but we haven't had a chance to ask him. Is he healthy? Um, is he mentally fit? Because as Brown pointed out after the uh, TCU game, that was a tough game for him. He's roommates with Aubrey Burks. He's really good friends with Trey Lathan. And that was the one-year anniversary from his injury against Texas. So a whole lot goes on there. That's one game. That could have affected him that game. And then you look at the entire season. It's just not as good, but it was good last year. Our team's more familiar. They're definitely playing close with the line of scrimmage against him, but his numbers aren't what they were. Um, Tempo's good for everybody. I thought they should have gone to that. We talked about changes they can make during the bye week. I just figured that was a way to wake them up a little bit, get guys into a groove. You practice fast, you play fast sometimes, but also like when you play fast, you don't you don't have a lot of time to come back down to earth and to think about this or that or what hurts or what are they going to do to stop me. You just run your stuff, and maybe that's good for him, but also you take it out in the defense a little bit, and that's not a guy you want running at you again and again and again and again. And, and when he makes you tackle him a couple of times, he does make you feel it there too. I think what we forget about him though is that he's not like a 4-4 guy um, he, he's not like a naturally gifted running back that has all these great moves and instincts. He's very good at one cut and getting body square and going downhill. That, that's not to say it's a limited skill set, but is that going to be a guy who's just consistently running away from teams and players? I don't know. But to the point we made many times, these, these running backs kind of run to contact. And his thing is that he's not getting through and getting around those tackles right now. When you put more people in their line of scrimmage, that's going to be more of an obstacle for him too. But, I wonder if there are ways to get him outside, like they're flipping the ball to different people because you want to get him clean and running in space and then make the defense deal with them rather than make him get through the defense to get clear and in space. And I, there's got to be ways they can scheme that up and make it better for him. Yeah, absolutely. I do think there's, there's something to him, like being a little more hesitant in the backfield, dancing around a little bit. It, just looking at the film of him last year compared to this year, last year he just, it was almost like he wasn't thinking. It was also it was almost like it was good that he wasn't a running back because it was just I get ball, I go, that's it. Like I just you know, run to that spot, go that way, good, got it, done. And I felt like that's why he was successful last year, and I think that's why he's not successful so far this season. I think he's struggling to kind of just hit the lane and go. Now, this past game. And, and also that that's related to his missed tackles for us, right? We keep talking about that and how he's one of the worst in the entire big 12 conference, which is just stunning given how good he was at it last year, but his 240 pounds, it doesn't do you any good. If it's not moving forward, it, it's still easy to take down. If it's 
moving slowly, if it's dancing side to side, if it's chopping his feet and kind of trying to find his blockers. 240 pounds is difficult to take down when it's going full speed straight up and down the field. And we're just not seeing that as much as here. And, and whose fault that is? Is it scheme? Is it blocking? Is it is it him? I think it's a, a mix of all those things. Like this most recent game, that was the worst performance by the offensive line so far this season. And and the stats back that up. The stats of when um, defenders are making contact with the running backs. This was the the worst of the season thus far. And it was also the best of the season for C.J. Donaldson as far as his yards after contact per carry, his yards after – or his missed tackles forced. This was the most missed tackles he's forced in a game this season, tied with – well, tied with Duquesne. But that was, you know, an FCS opponent. So this was – it may not have felt like it, but that was the best Donaldson yet. And I do – I'm with you. I think part of it was like this this tempo of giving him the ball, get it going, and, and that was when maybe he was getting moving. Something to think about, too, is that you can say what you want about PFF grades, and they're not even universal, but like it's a number that everybody has applied to them. But like West Virginia's run blocking grade is about middle of the pack in the country. And we've been over a lot of like the yards before contact. And if you're not breaking tackles, you're getting yards before contact. That's tough. That's a tough combination there, too. And just if you look at some of Donaldson's numbers where he's had better games for the year, he's about two to one zone to gap. And this is by and large a zone running team. But when he's had his best moments, and even that comes inside of the, his best games, much heavier on gap running. So, like, his big game so far this season was Pitt. He was even in zone and gap runs. Um, played well against Penn State. Just about even zone and gap runs. Played all right against TCU at times. I know that that was, like, the game we're talking about that was a struggle for him. But when you stack up the yardage, I think it's his third best total of the year. Pretty even. 13-9 uh, to nine zone to gap. So, Maybe it's a predictability thing. Maybe he's just better at gap running. Maybe he's more powerful running behind guys and blowing through holes that are cleared in front of him. But um, maybe he just needs some help from his offensive line, too. It could be gap. It could be just better performances by the offensive lineman. Moving to the next uh, running back in the room. There were questions about, where was that one at? I'm trying to pull up the one correctly about Jaheim White. White was tied for second in running back snaps. Should he be closer to Donaldson or more of an even split for all three? From WVUG 13. Mike, how do you feel about the way or amount that White was used on Thursday night? Well, first, I don't like all three. I just I just don't think you can get two going, never mind one, um, with three running backs. And if you're going to do three, then you're not going to have – if you have 25 snaps, you're not going to have, you know, 16, 5, and 4. You, you can't do that because you're, you're not giving everybody their best opportunity there. So you got to find a way to get that third guy a series, I guess. I don't know. or mix them in. I don't know what happened to two-back personnel. I'm assuming they can't do it. They don't like it because they're not using it. So there's not really a way to do that anymore. And is there such a difference between two and three right now in production? Probably not. Maybe White's a little bit better than Anderson. But the change-up between White and Donaldson could be good for Donaldson. It's probably good for White. But if all of a sudden you start stretching out Jaheim White, Outside zone, outside zone, inside zone, outside zone. And then here comes your wrecking ball through the middle with a gap play. Well, now it's a different thing for the defense to deal with. Maybe they're a little bit tired from running sideways so much you catch this little running back, and all of a sudden you got the 240 pounds coming at you. You're like, oh, this will be easier. Nope. So I, I like maybe investing a little bit more in Jaheim White right now if he can handle that. A lot of other stuff he has to do out there in the field to make that work, and I'm not sure that that's where it has to be right now, but – um the Anderson snaps this year for just different reasons haven't been very good. He hasn't looked like he did in that one game last year against Oklahoma State. Had moments, has not had stretches, and he's not done it reliably. And as White has gotten healthy and has gotten more accustomed to practice and the coaches have gotten a look at him more consistently, his snap count has risen, his production has increased. I don't know what stops us from going in this direction unless White's just not physically ready to do it and hold up over games, but when it comes to physical discussion, I do like the the black and the white, the yin and the yang of of Donaldson and White more so than Donaldson and Anderson, who are who are kind of similar players, not the same, but similar skill set. Even when it comes to running routes and catching passes, we're in the same boat on that one. I do think once you start trying to squeeze in three running backs, getting them all reps, it's it's just not going to work. Like especially like you said, if you're not going with a two back personnel, if you're going with a two back personnel. You can find snaps for three running backs. 
you're going with one running back, you might have enough snaps for two. Um, and I do think so at times, if you're going to, if you're going to try to force that third one in there, it's taking away from the effectiveness, effectiveness of the other two. So I think, I think maybe you're going to see some of these, um, snap counts become a little more clear moving forward. And don't forget um, too, like green kind of factors into running backs. They're not calling 10 yeah. run plays for him, but a couple of half, that's like the quantity of your third running back. So now you're talking, do you want four? I don't, I just don't know if that works and everything can function around it. Uh, speaking of Anderson, there were several questions here about the interception at the goal line. Um, one of them centered around, you know, what, 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 what happened on that play? Was it all on him? Was it his fault? Another one was kind of putting the blame on, um, on Garrett Green, asking if he should have ever even thrown that ball in that situation. I think that was, yeah, that was from Pierre Squared. Uh, and then the questions of just what what the heck happened was from Salty Dog 8159. Um, first off, Mike, how much of that is on Garrett Green? I mean, I guess he could have just like extended a 60-yard arm and handed it to Anderson, like, like Inspector Gadget, and shame on Green for not having that capability. But I don't know what else he's supposed to do there. Like, it's not an easy sport. You're going to have to make hard throws and catches. And that was a courageous throw and uh, a critical mistake. And as I'm with Brown on this one there, it's not a stat that will be kept. But that really should go more of as a fumble, a lost fumble for Jalen Anderson than an interception for Garrett Green. Help me out, Chris. What's the criticism here of this play? What am I missing? I, I don't know. Because I mean, there I are questions it was... to it. I've seen it elsewhere. Yeah. Like, I've been on the board on, and people have asked me about it. Like, because it's kind of flooded on that side of the field. There's more defenders. Is that like, I get that. Like, oh, he threw into a crowded area. Um, it, I mean, is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think that's that's where Pierre Squared was getting at. Was like, hey, there's there's more open field other places. The offense is moving. No need to force it kind of thing. But, I mean, my stance here is if we don't want the quarterback to throw a ball directly into the hands of a receiver in the end zone. I'm not sure what our goal is for the quarterback here. Cause like that was a beautiful pass. It was directly into Jalen Anderson's hands. Just had to catch it. Yes. It was a tight window that just made it a better throw. Um, that safety um, Hamilton, I think it was coming over the top. Who was the one that, that ended up intercepting it. I mean, he just, Right place, right time. It bounces out of Anderson's hands right into his hands. But I don't I don't know how that's on green. I, I think it's the right move. I think it's the right call. If I recall, remember correctly, I believe there was pressure. So, you know, finding uh Anderson there going on the wheel route and, and hitting him directly in the hands of the in the end zone, it's hard for me to kind of pin blame on green on this one. I guess the one there's a couple of things you could do here. Is that a play that's best suited for the short side of the field? Because you're on, like, if I remember, it's on the right hash, and you're going right, in. You're right. Okay, so, like, now you're you're really wiping off two-thirds of the field, and you're putting a whole bunch of eyeballs on the short side. Okay. The other thing is that West Virginia runs that play a ton. And it, it's really, it's a cool thing what they do, because the receiver, it, it, they vary, if I'm remembering correctly, they vary the routes all the time. And when, when Mark Gill got hot against Texas Tech, they ran this concept. Um, and it's just simple, but like what it does is it, it makes it simple on the quarterback. Cause now you're only looking at one spot. So the benefit here of going short side of the field is you're not really going the whole field. You're seeing everything and you can catch the white jerseys among the black jerseys and, and figure out where they're going because you know, the route and the combinations, but some combination of the jet goes in the flat, the running back wheels, the receiver goes deep and the tight end posts, or it's all mixed up. Maybe the guy on the flat wheels and the running back posts and the tight end goes deep. Like there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. So there's combination one through, I don't know, however many there might be, but on this one, he like Anderson's open. He's past two defenders because one guy takes the jet. One guy takes the deep receiver. So you have an opening. I don't think anybody necessarily had Cole Taylor in the middle. And again, I'm just going back in my head here as I'm looking here, but here's the play now. Yeah. Um, but like, you've got a guy that's supposed to be as good as a receiver running down the sideline and this offense struggles to make big plays and scores that you can't look at that and go, that picture isn't quite perfect enough. Again, hard sport, got to make hard plays and nobody is going to be 
crediting Jalen Anderson for making a great catch there. They'd be like, wow, what a great throw by Green. Just because the ending changes, I don't think the analysis can change. It probably is a very good throw by Green. Touchdown, drop, interception, whatever you want to call it. Just Anderson has to close the book on that play. He has to. Next question. Well, there's kind of a couple of them, and obviously they are connected because Dan Proud asked, is Justin Johnson the best running back on the team? And my immediate thought was, well, if he was, he'd be playing more. But then brings up the second half of this from 23 years. Uh, if one is staying and 100 is hitting the porter, where does J.J. fall on that scale? You know, uh, kind of insinuating that he could be a self red shirt guy. Mike, can you give us the latest on what's going on with Johnson here? Nope. Have to ask him. Okay. Um, he was He was not – in Houston, correct? He's only played three games. He did not travel. Um, he traveled to TCU. So something is up there, but he was hurt earlier in the year and didn't play. But they're also saying that they're not going to tell you who's doing the self right shirt. So if he's not in uniform Saturday, um, that could be a clue. But it's also something we can just ask, too. Like there's a news conference today, and the guy who only has two carries – and it's supposed to be a bigger part of this offense. There's there's some explanation. They're always hurt. That's why this guy's not playing. Or you know what? He's just not gonna be a part of things going forward. Okay, fine. But have seen no social media announcement and and just to be honest, I haven't heard his name a whole lot for whatever reason here that may be out of sight, out of mind, but which is not a fair answer to the question. But it it's whether he's healthy or not right now, you're looking at eligibility wise, another year for Donaldson, another year for Anderson, another year for White. Like, are they gonna is he gonna be able to be better? Again, like, is he going to do this offseason thing again? We're like, oh, this is his this is his offseason. This is his year. Is he going to be able to clear this clutter and get back on the field in a higher spot? It would seem like no right now. And the fact that he could redshirt right now and transfer and be eligible next year, I would say it's more likely than not at this point. But that's as much of a numbers and a college football thing in that position and not some some inside knowledge I have here. Just You, know, you kind of use your eyes sometimes here. A guy who's not playing, not getting action with a young and talented position group, that doesn't look good for his future, right? No, no, it does not. Um, yeah, I, the, even when it was the, oh, yeah, he's injured thing, it felt strange. Like, it felt like an after the fact, oh, he was injured, you know, kind of thing. And sometimes, you know, they're not telling everyone every single injury. He, they they have done a better job of just being upfront about serious injuries with guys, um, about serious, but even guys that are like week to week. And he was very open about Tomas Rematch and, and Wyatt Milam leading into the week. but. The Justin Johnson one was, if I recall correctly, like not really mentioned beforehand. And then after the fact, like, oh, yeah, 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 he was hurt. He was hurt. He was hurt. And and then, like you said, it's kind of been on the travel list, then not on the travel list, then on the travel list, and then the travel to TCU. And I don't know. It, I guess we'll find out maybe today, maybe the next, maybe on Saturday, like you said, if he's on the sideline or not. But at this point, I feel like it should be pretty clear that if you're looking for to Justin Johnson for answers for this year's team to turn things around the next couple of weeks, I, I would not expect that. Is that a safe assumption, regardless of what the reasoning is? You know, he's never struck me as a very dynamic player. Like he's been effective, but we've also never seen him really stretched out. I think his career high is ten or eleven carries, and then I think he had maybe that Tech game last year. He was very good, but never never put that into a line of really good performances. Now, granted, never had a ton of opportunities, but like even last season, like after the uh, Donaldson injury, injuries, I guess, wasn't wasn't a great help, I guess you would say. So is, is, what are you looking for there? What are you getting out of him? Um, the Texas and Baylor game, so the, the game of the Johnson, excuse me, Anderson injury. How about this? The game of the Donaldson injury, Texas, and then the week after Baylor, uh, 22 carries, 86 yards, right about four yards a carry there. Nothing pops off the page there, but you're looking at a guy who carried the ball 98 times for 430 yards last year, so about 4.4 a carry, two carries this year, two games he's carried the ball. Um, something's not right there, so probably worth the question. Speaking of worth a question, this one was apparently worth – seven eight nine questions in the thread um all related to neil brown's future i think i think we went about 
six days to 10 days. There was the, the open week in there. So 10 days of no questions about Neil Brown's future at WVU. Now seems he's firmly back on the hot seat, at least according to the message board, which the message board will never steer you wrong. Um, let me see how many, how many different ways I want to phrase these questions. Uh, Braves fan 82 says Mike alluded to seven and five, potentially not being good enough. What is good enough based on the schedule? Um, RBC WVU says you're Ren Baker. You were at the game. How are you feeling about your head coach after Thursday? Just a fluke heartbreaking loss or just more questions. And then Clarence over flat out ass. How do they finish the regular season record wise? Still don't think the schedule is hard. I think I think they're going to lose to Oklahoma, but I think all the other games are capable of of coming out victorious because I don't I just don't think the world of their opponents. Like seriously, like if they come in and and get steamrolled by a, a percolating Oklahoma State, that looks bad to me. That that just means a lot of stuff. That this team is resilient. They're going through adversity. I mean, it'd be a bad result, but it would also kind of puncture some of the ideas that have so far puffed this team up and made it. At first four and one, and now four and two, because now you got a really good test. And this is a mature team that has come together and really weathered some stuff. And that was all true when they were playing with backup quarterbacks and going through rivalry games and seeing teammates carved out the field. That was all true. It's got to be true now. And if it's not, if they roll over and they lose two in a row, that's bad. If they lose three in a row, that's bad. That just means that stuff isn't quite true. It sounds good. It doesn't really. Uh, lift this team up but you know their their season is probably going to come down to what they can do on the road here um their home schedule is oklahoma state byu and cincinnati could be a lot harder than that their road schedule is at ucf at oklahoma at baylor could be a lot harder than that but they're they just haven't been a great program on the road teams typically don't play as well on the road i would say later in the season that could be even more more troublesome um and that oklahoma game could take a toll on you that is with you a week later who knows but it's it's difficult to say. It's not the world of their schedule right now. Where where are you on how they finish? I don't know. I just because like I just I've had a hard time figuring this team out right now. I think I know what they are and who they are, but I've been misled a couple of times. Sometimes by me, sometimes by them. Well, oh, there is another question in here. I'm still looking for it as you were talking because it, it was something I discussed uh, earlier in the week about how you know it, it, it's not some novel concept, but changing of expectations once the season gets going, once yep. once you get to where you, you, you go. Because before the season, the Vegas line was four and a half. Like, I think it started at five, it dropped to four and a half. And then West Virginia started four and one. So then you reevaluate, reevaluate your expectations. And at four and one, and as you're looking at the schedule, like you said, it's not it wasn't that hard. I believe at that time, before the Houston game, there were four, West Virginia had four games against teams that were a combined one and nine in Big 12 play. Um, A part of that was Houston, of course, because they had not won. But even still, even after losing to Houston, Westford, there are one, two, three, four, five teams that are under 500 in Big 12 play, one and two or 0 and three. West Virginia plays all of them. I mean, one of them was Houston, so they play the other four still, still. So does that mean they're going to go eight and four? Like that seems tough, as you noted. You know, it's hard to kind of go on the road, even if against if even if it's against a less equal or lesser team. But you have those four teams, and then one of the only two teams that are better than you record wise or same as you record wise, Oklahoma State, is coming to your house on homecoming. Like, so you should have some kind of home field advantage with that. You are currently favored in that game. There's a possibility that West Virginia is favored. Now, Vegas likes uh, home teams, obviously, but you are going to be favored in some form or fashion, whether it's computer models or or statistically or Vegas, in five of your last six games. Yeah. If you go two and four with that, that's not great. Like three and three, that puts you at seven to five. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Again, you, you, it's it's the ever evolving expectations for this team, and and you know that's that it, that's what athletics sure. are. You, it's, it's not something just against Neil Brown and WVU. Yeah, it's like anything else too. The more you play, the more the stakes change. The more you win, you know, the greater the stakes at the end. So when you're playing and you're winning more now too, well, everything changes because there's there's different seven and fives. Chris, so they start, you know, with two wins in their first seven games. 
And then all of a sudden they rip off five wins. They're like, all right, I could I could talk myself into this again. And quite the opposite. If you start four and one or five and two or whatever, and you finish seven to five, that looks bad. And then how do you get to seven? Do you do you win all your road games? Cool. But then you're disappointing your home fans. That's not great. Maybe your home attendance isn't good. Do you beat Oklahoma again and get like a, a bona fide win, like a capital W win? Like not, nothing like, oh, that's a bad year for Oklahoma or it was a home game or, oh, change quarterbacks and I caught the Sooners by surprise. No, you go on the road and you beat a top whatever team that has CFP aspirations. That's a big feather in your cap and you can use that to, you know, drown out some other noise too. So how they get there is is just, it's really, really important, right, too. But also that they get there is really, really important. I, I don't know the seven and five as a rubber stamp to give these guys another year. I just don't. And I don't know that you you say seven to five, well, let's see what they do in the bowl game because now you're using valuable time too. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot on the table too. And like the, the only thing that puts out the fire, Chris, is ink. You, you sign an extension or you sign termination papers and that's when the fire goes out. So like all these wins and losses lead you to something, which is why that's the saying, like why the only thing that puts out is ink because the only thing that gets you extended or fired are the results. So it's hard to say right now what it's going to be because it just feels like you're at some intersection here where they can go one way or the other. And it's it's largely um, to be decided, I think. But to say that he's safe seems like just a fallacy to me. But to say that he can't salvage his job and be back next year also seems completely ridiculous because there's nothing on that schedule that says this is undoable. There's some winnable games at home and even on the road there too. So. They they still have a lot to play for with them, and and we forget they done some good things, and, and you know there were moments on Thursday night against a bad defense or maybe like a stumbling offense where it did look good until it didn't. So there's something there that even within that game there was an intersection and went the wrong way. Now they're out of the game, they're at the intersection. They got to figure out you know what blinker to hit here. Yeah, and from the angle of hey, you're the athletic director standing on the sideline. I'm thinking to that game and. There's a couple a couple things like you're like, hey, you know, why are you not going up tempo? Why are you not being more aggressive towards the end of the first half? You know, we talked about that already. Why why was the Hail Mary defense the way that it was? Again, you and I talked about that, but then there was also this this variable of are you locked into that? Like you just simply do not have the personnel right now, um, because of injuries and everything else that's going on. But how much of that game am I looking at being like, this is such a negative look on the coach or the coaching staff? Because a lot of what I saw in that game was they made changes to the offense and it worked. The defense was in the right positions. There weren't a lot of plays where, you know, somebody's, you know, remember, think back to last year when it was like the guys were confused. They didn't know where they were lining up. They're looking at each other pre-snap. They're running all over the place. And guys are running wide open for for big gains and touchdowns. Last night, Malachi Ruffin, Marcus Floyd, Beanie Bishop, all of those guys were there and around the ball and just weren't making plays. And like I'm not trying to pin it all on on the players or just a handful of players, but a lot of the reasons that I saw West Virginia lost on Thursday night, why what Houston had success on offense, why West Virginia wasn't getting things going was because not because of coaching or play calling, but because the players simply were not making plays. They were not winning their one-on-ones. You have to win those individual battles. And West Virginia was not winning them on Thursday night. And it, it felt to me like, for the most part, like nobody's pitching a perfect game here. The coaching staff's not pitching a perfect game either. But it felt like the coaches were putting players in position to make the plays, and they didn't. I'd agree with that. I think it's fair. But also, if you want to get in the coaching thing, I would say, man, the strength of this team is the offensive line, and it had a very bad game. I might also say they're missing 40% of that offensive line. And you might say, wow, the receivers aren't doing it this year, but they're kind of young at some spots. Well, they went out and hit the portal. So there's a whole bunch of yeah, but stuff too. Like, yeah, this didn't look good, but um, I think you could say, you know, yeah, they had a lot of injuries, but they don't have depth. And depth is a program thing. And a coach and a staff has to have depth and develop it and trust it and play it. And there's a lot of things that you could grant an exception for here, but also say that it doesn't have to be this way because coaching can make it better. Like the offensive line should be consistent and not have games like that. The receivers are so many there. They should have a couple on the field and know what they're doing. Receivers weren't the problem that game. Don't get me wrong. 
you know, hey, thin in the secondary. Well, why don't they have more bodies that are ready or on campus? So there's a lot of that stuff you could do. I think that's that's pretty interesting too. But and then just you know how how the hail mary gets unpacked behind closed doors, like where it's true. We're not we're gonna get a this should have worked if not for this on the hail mary when we ask about it. But there's gonna be a much more candid conversation there, and it could just be like we had the wrong people in the field. We were slow out of the off the sideline. We thought they were going to take a timeout. We were backpedaling. We didn't have the right guys. We just didn't play it right. Um, something went wrong there. And like, I wonder what the explanation is. It's going to be like the truth that we don't get is probably what Rem Baker looks for and what he sees. I don't think he's too upset about the, I know he's upset about the 15 yard penalty, but I'm sure that that's not like, you know, this coach has to go because Brown is so adamant about that celebration stuff. Um, like getting mad at Cole Taylor for signaling first down, he just doesn't condone that. I don't know that's a program thing unless you're just saying that there's no discipline, but that's not a habit of this team. Like, okay, CJ Donaldson took his hat off and now Gary Green did. Do we have, do we have the hives? I don't know about that. I just, but again, they stepped in the rake and that's what this program had done for a long, long time. It seemed to be clear of that and was kind of navigating the landscape without incident. And then it happened at a really bad time. But even when that happens, other stuff has to happen in conjunction with that to make it really matter and make it pay. But it did, and for that to be on the table is probably striking, especially striking if we're at the athletic director too. But don't forget, they looked dead to rights in the fourth quarter and then woke up. So that went from you know a, a kind of a, maybe a debilitating defeat for getting one-sided by a team that isn't all that great to, wow, here's what this offense is maybe capable of. Here are the playmakers doing things in a road game and getting a win that they should and had to have to, Boy, that's a heck of a way to lose a game. You don't see that very often. Like, there's a whole lot of stuff that's swirling in Rem Baker's head, I'm sure, but he's also in there talking to people and having those conversations. And again, I think like the truth that may be obscured or even hidden sometimes from us on the outside, it doesn't hide inside, especially when the boss is walking around and asking questions and, and knows some things and knows the people who to ask. That that'll be very interesting to see like what this does to the conversation going forward. But there's there's a lot of elements in there too that but it's like a very variable situation. Let's close it with a basketball question, Mike. We can't leave our basketball junkies out in the cold, even if it is fall season. Um, this one from GD Full. Based on what you know or have heard coming out of the not so secret scrimmage, are you more or less optimistic about basketball season? Anything we can take from what you may or may not be hearing from the scrimmage? Just no Raekwon battle makes me kind of suspend any opinions of what's going to happen because that's a starter and potentially like an 18 point a game guy on a really good offense. And if not, there's a massive hole that they're going to probably have to play differently if he's not there. And the, um, to be so confident or at least hopeful that it was coming this week, I, the NCAA typically gives you time frames and says, Hey, when's your, when's your secret scrimmage or your, your exhibition or whatever, like the first time that you compete and you need eligible and ineligible players. West Virginia says Saturday the 14th and the NCAA says, all right, you're going in this pile, pile C. We'll get to it. You know, we got this whole thing at UNC right now and some football ones. We'll get to yours, right? In time and didn't. Now, why? Don't know. Um, I have not heard it was declined and they put a waiver in or an appeal or anything like that. I haven't heard that. I just haven't heard. I just heard they didn't play. That's all. Um, so without him and his however many points a game, it kind of makes me wonder if that'd be a difference between going to overtime against Vanderbilt and losing, I believe, um, maybe that doesn't happen. And maybe you have his 18 points or his 16 or his 12 and his rebounds and dunks and defense. Like maybe that makes a difference there too. So I think what it underscores is that they'd really like to have him. And if they don't have him, it's hard to figure out what they're going to be right now, but that's a conversation for another day. So what you're saying is the NCAA looked at it and said, oh, WVU needs it by – October 14th, so we'll get it done by November 1st. But if this were Kentucky or UNC, it would have been done already. Well, I mean, they could be on the Kansas basketball plan. That's true. Granted, that always works out well, but it did take, like, what, six years? Yeah. So like that. could be different there, too. I think it would be fun to watch and play. It's going to be almost two weeks now they play, not this Friday, but next Friday? Friday it's Friday, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Um... Don't make me look at a calendar. I can't figure it out. George Mason charity exhibition. I was just I was gonna I was gonna call it the Norma Ray Huggins charity exhibition game, but I don't know that to be true anymore. So I kind of got tongue tied for a second there. But um, they should have an answer by then, and whether yes or no, they'll have some 
some runway to use before you actually see the team there too. But I haven't really talked to a whole bunch of people yet about that. Just some some text messages back and forth, but I haven't had a chance to debrief anybody, and that'll probably wait until – actually, you know what? We don't get basketball in person this week because they're at the Big 12 tip-off event or whatever they're calling it. It used to be called Media Days, but the media doesn't really attend that one too much, it seems like, middle of fo- football week, so it's hard to get there. So what Josh Eiler has to say about his team probably won't touch on the scrimmage at all, but maybe we could get some details from behind closed doors there. I believe it was in Cincinnati, right? Weird. Yes. No comment. Okay. I wasn't invited. Okay. Neil Brown. Select players, coordinators. On a most interesting Monday of the football week, Saturday, 3.30 p.m., Oklahoma State. A lot to fill in the gaps in between. Get some players, get some thoughts about what happened there. I will probably find a way to share some of the thoughts about what people have kind of told me in, in private about West Virginia, and in particular that that game and that play at the end of the game, how they would have done it, what it looked like. Um, a lot, again, a couple days ago, obviously, but I feel like there's a lot hanging on that game, so we might as well uh, grab it and take a look and see what we can do there. What do you have coming up here, Chris? I'm going to have the a lot of the usual stuff, but also like if, if I seem distracted as we're recording this, it's because I got a text message from five-star point guard that West Virginia just offered, and uh, no offense, you Mike or our listeners, but when a five star point guard messages you, you go ahead and start answering because Lord only knows when that's going to stop. The responses are going to stop. So try to get my questions in now and and get a story up on that in the next day or so. So keep an go. eye out for that one. Go <laughs> until then. I'm Mike Casaza and I'm Chris Anderson. We'll talk to you then. <laughs>